My name is Nicola, aka Socrates, and you're watching Singularity One on One. If you guys enjoy this show, you can help me make it better by writing a review on iTunes or by simply making a donation. Today, my guest on the show is Marcin Jakubowski. Marcin got a PhD in physics, but frustrated with the lack of relevance to pressing world issues in his education, he founded Open Source Ecology in order to make closed loop manufacturing a reality. Then he began development of the Global Village Construction Set, which is an open source, open source tool set of 50 industrial machines necessary to create a small civilization with modern comforts. His work has been recently recognized as a 2012 TED Senior Fellow, and Marcin has a fantastic uh, TED uh, talk that I recommend everyone should watch, as well as Time Magazine's Best Inventions of 2012 and a White House Champion of Change in 2013. So welcome to Singularity One-on-One, -on -one, Marcin. Welcome. Glad to be here. Fantastic. So, Martin, I used uh, your kind of official biography to introduce you, uh, but if I were to ask you in a very conversational, friendly manner to introduce yourself in, in your own few words, how would you do that best? Well, I'm just a farmer scientist. <laughs> that's, that's a very common way to say it. Um, there's a lot of truth to that. I mean, I would call, I would say open source ecologist, though nobody knows that. It's a kind of a brainy term. It really gets into what, what this topic is about. But that's, that, I would say, between farmer scientist and open source ecologist, um, wow. industrial wow. designer. Mm. So that's all very interesting. And we are definitely going to try to unpack what open source ecology means a little later. But let me try and play first a little bit on the tension between farmer scientists, okay? Because on the one hand, your training was kind of very strictly academic. I mean, nuclear fusion is so remote and academic from the real world. Uh, not very practical, at least not yet. And it's always been yeah. kind of 30 years away. And on the other hand, a farmer is someone who literally gets their hands dirty. So that must have been a big shift for you. Tell me a little bit about the journey and what motivated you to do that in the first place. Right. Ever since I was a small child, I mean, I thought about the power of science. My father's a scientist. He's a molecular biologist. And uh, I thought about good things that can be done with science to make everybody's life easy and beautiful. That's, of course, the promise. But then, then you find out about the whole geopolitical system, find about the ills, and things aren't as rosy as, as could be. I mean, the reductionist viewpoint or the simple idea is, oh, yeah, science, amazing technology, prosperity for everybody. But that's not what happens. And if, so I try to pursue the higher learning route to get to the bottom of it. But the farther I went, the, the more useless actually I felt in terms of solving any pressing world issues. Naturally, the farther you go, and especially to the PhD, you know everything about nothing. And if you cannot make the relationship between the ecology of things, how things work together, then you are in a compromised position. You cannot make a better world. So um, there was an episode. So, okay, undergrad, I did chemistry. I thought, oh, you know, it was highly theoretical, Princeton. Uh, didn't really do it. So I went further. Physics, okay, now maybe we'll get something done here. But no, I mean, once again, very theoretical. I mean, one time I went to a professor to ask, well, what's, we were studying wave propagation. I asked, well, what's this uh, long equation here? Is this some wave traveling through space here? And he says, oh, no, it doesn't exist. I just made it up. And I said, well, okay, that's what we do here. We're playing with concepts, things that do not exist, yet there are real pressing issues on the planet. And I want to be solving those. So, so I was re got really frustrated. Basically, I made it through. I mean, I, I ended up sticking, sticking out. My father told me I should finish. I was going to quit. Yeah. Um, so I did finish writing a decent paper, stuff like that. But the last year of the program, I, I created open source ecology and specifically because even in my field, I could not talk openly to others. We had hot material and of course you're competing for research and grant money or whatever. So what I thought, wow, done? it was about wavelet. It's, it's about wavelet analysis of fusion turbulence. So basically trying to visualize what the turbulent ball of fire that little sun inside a fusion reactor looks like. We're trying to visualize that. Uh, so it was experimental. 
a uh, little bit of hands on there, but I mean, no, I mean, that, that didn't do it. But the, the story was because I couldn't talk openly to others, I thought this is an extreme waste. I mean, how can we do this? We're at a public institution. Why is this happen here? Uh, I was befuddled and um, I thought, I, boy, I'm just wasting my time here. So, so I said, how do we really apply knowledge to make, make things better? And that's when I, I coined the, the program for open source ecology. What would it look like if we actually truly collaborate to solve, solve issues faster than they're created? Mm -hmm. So basically, uh, the, the, there's a number of things that jump at me there, but one of them mm -hmm. is that you want a more of a holistic approach and yeah. you to kind of see the results, the fruits of your labor, actually, rather than have them always 30, 30 years uh, ahead in time. But mm -hmm. before we get to the details of that, tell me a little bit, why was it not possible for you to share your knowledge in the academia, in the field, in the realm that you were working on? What was the problem? What was preventing that sharing of knowledge? Because as we know, knowledge is one of those crazy things that the more you share it, the more it grows. That's what you would think, but the funding model in academia is grants. So if you write something in a grant, you're careful about telling that to your colleague because he can write that in a grant and snatch that money from underneath you because there's a finite pool. That's just a simple way it works there. So are you saying that basically there's competition among academics doing the same research for a limited pool of uh, grant money? That was the case in my area. And I, I, we can probably extend that, that that's prevalent everywhere, i.e. the so-called institution of open learning is not very open. Mm -hmm. And just actually a couple of days ago, I published uh, or I shared uh, on my social media profile, there is a movement and actually there's been a decision in Europe to make sure that all publicly funded science gets publicly shared. Uh, and, and they're trying to sort of uh, convert that previously secret research into public one and complete that whole process by 2020, or that's their stated goal anyway. So they've already began it, but they want to make every European science project that was publicly funded, publicly available in terms of results, mm -hmm. protocols, et cetera, by 2020. That's a good idea. And then it also makes you ask, because research is basic, a lot of research is basic research, um, the way it works, well, at least, I mean, <clears throat> one of the stories about research is that now, of course, research departments are basically private, basically private corporations, research arms, when it comes to so-called useless knowledge, um, you're welcome to produce that. But once it's, but, but mm, maybe that's a way to, not a good way to say. It. In academia, there's a lot of re basic research that goes on, but you'll, if you observe that carefully, once you actually start getting close to anything that's actually a real product, that, that quickly vanishes, it goes under, you know, it hides, it, it disappears. You can't access it. There's a lot of stuff that, that you can't do anything with and, and people are not afraid to share that. But, but if there is something that's economically significant, that, that I would say in general disappears. It's, that's not to be found in academia. I mean, it would be great if academia were actually the open source product development centers of the world where everyone benefits. Yeah. And, and when you decided to find open source ecology, did, what did your academic friends uh, think about that? Well, I kind of ran <laughs> into the middle of nowhere, Missouri. I didn't have the chance to have a chance to look back, <laughs> so I don't really know. But um, of course, we're we're the freaks, right? The outcasts of society because we're doing something that's not standard. Uh, but unfortunately, I do not do not have any direct quotes to share. <laughs> you know, well, speaking of direct quotes, let me share a quote that you remind me of a little bit. Uh, I think it's uh, um, it goes something like this. The reasonable man adapts to the world. Mm. The unreasonable man refuses to adapt herself to the world, but tries to adapt the world to themselves. Yeah. For all progress depends on the unreasonable man. So you strike me as one of those unreasonable people. Exactly. Who said that? Um, um, give me... I heard him. 
before uh, of time and the... I'll, I'll tell you exactly the where the quote comes from uh so yeah that's a nice quote i, I like that one i heard it yeah and and tell me what is it that you believe that other people think is totally crazy then what what is it that makes you unreasonable what, what's so nuts uh that I, or at least not in your view but other people would say about you yeah i would say it's probably the integrated nature of the approach i mean we're trying to put together everything from there's science there's nature there's business entrepreneurship there's human evolution psychology i mean it's it's all the, the whole kind of entrepreneurial game i would say that we're not the outcasts in any entrepreneurial outliers such as like the ted fellows of which i'm a member uh, i mean we're all freaks over there and we we en enjoy that and we have a hard time explaining our stuff to the rest to the world i mean it's just on a i think the integrative i think the common thread for a lot of people that are on a cutting edge is the integrative aspect and hence the word ecology in the open source ecology name i would say Mm -hmm. It's just thinking about the larger picture and, and how to act on it today. Yeah, ecology is a very, very broad term, and that scares a lot of people, especially from uh, academic background, I think. But going back to the quote I gave you, that quote is from George Bernard Shaw, um, um, mm -hmm. for revolutionists, uh, yeah. called Man and Superman, which was published in 1903, by the way, just, just for reference. Anyway, okay. To track it down. Um, yeah. So, okay. So, what's your dream? What's the best case scenario? What's the thing that makes you jump out of bed early in the morning and keep oh, yeah. going when all other people want to stop? Right. Uh, the best case scenario is the basics, which to me is transcending artificial scarcity. So, we live in a world where scarcity in politics, economics is the dominant paradigm. And it's things like resource conflicts, um, poverty, war, hunger. Those are all materially based and society as a whole has not solved that one yet. In my view, that's a prerequisite for any form of human evolution. That means if we're going to evolve as people, we have to have our basic needs met, like a Maslow's pyramid, which goes up. Then you can actually go keep going up and start transcending and, and evolving as a person mm -hmm. but we got to meet our needs first and that's to me that's such low-hanging fruit we have ten thousand times more power that comes from the sun than we use today mm -hmm. we got abundant resources namely rocks sunlight plants soil water that's what all the modern civilization is made of there's, so, there's a lot of it so so what do you say to skeptics who would tell you well Martin? We live in a world of scarcity. There is always going to be people who are starving. There is always mm -hmm. going to be poor. There is always going to be people who, mm -hmm. in their millions and hundreds of millions and maybe billions, will not be able to meet the fundamental first couple of levels of Maslow's pyramid. I say to them, it's our choice. It's a mindset. It's a choice because on first principles, you cannot, cannot make an argument for scarcity. Therefore, it's what happens with our mind. I mean, I mean, in nature, maybe. Do, do animals and bacteria know scarcity? I don't know. But um, sure they do. we definitely have a choice. It's, uh, so there's a limited um, amount of food to go around or something like that. And, and areas yeah. to occupy and so on. Right. I think the, the thing about humans is that we're so extremely adaptable because we've evolved this fat brain that we can do a lot of things and we, we create options that get into more like ethics and how do we want to survive versus being able to survive solely. I mean, we're way beyond, we can be way beyond the plain survival. And there's, such, there's a lot of interesting things that happens there once you transcend the survival bit, which really nobody has because everyone's just fighting to survive. So, so after that, you can talk about things like self-determination, like Daniel Pink talks, talks about in a TED talk, The Surprising Science of Motivation. 
it's not the fat carrot on a stick that drives us, but much more fundamental things, the autonomy, mastery, and purpose. So th that's the next discussion we need to be having. And uh, we, can, we can do that. That's a choice. I believe it's a choice. And my actions reflect that. Well, I, what I was trying to push you more towards was to try and see mm. in your view, we have a, a situation of sort of permanent scarcity as some people mm -hmm. say that that's inevitable and it's always going to be a factor. Mm -hmm. Or do we have an issue where the problem is one of distribution rather? Oh, yes. Now that's, that's the other side of it. We, there is overproduction indeed. I mean, that's why we have marketing departments. We try to sell things because we've got so much of everything. So yeah, that's the other side. Distribution is, is broken. We can't produce much more than enough for anybody. So, so, I mean, that argument right there shows, hey, there's plenty for everybody. It's the distribution, it's the mechanisms, it's the finance capital, it's this and that, um, the whole system that prevents people from having a good lifestyle when there's plenty for everybody. Yeah, right. to me, the, for example, one of the sort of representations of that is the fact, or is two, two facts. One is that we have an explosion of obesity in North America while, mm -hmm. you know, hundreds of millions of people are starving. So we are stuffing yeah. us with calories. Uh, and, and secondly, right. you know, much of the, the food that's grown uh, in many of those starving countries actually goes out for exports to feed cattle. Uh, like for right. corn and, and stuff like that. Um, yeah. And, and even, even in cases when it's not grown locally in that specific country, uh, it still goes to feed cattle, which we eat, rather than feeding people, uh, which we can pick. So we do have, we, we know that we have uh, plenty, plenty of mm -hmm. food to go around. And actually, I was reading this. Mm -hmm we kill something like 60, perhaps even 65 billion animals per year on our planet. Over billion? 20 billion animals are slaughtered every year just in North America. And, and yeah. on the planet, 60 or 65 billion animals for food consumption every year, which is, you know, a flubbergasting number. Yeah, large number. Mm -hmm. Now, Let's let's move on and talk a little bit more specifically about uh, your project. So let's start mm -hmm. with the original one. Mm -hmm. What's the kind of mission and description of open source ecology? What? The mission in a nutshell is to create the open source economy. That means open source product development across. Right now, we started with the 50 industrial machines, the Global Village construction set which contains machines of production like CNC mills or induction furnaces or metal rolling. There's across all the sectors, machines for building houses, for transportation, for production, for energy production. Essentially, uh, trying to identify the smallest nucleus of items of machines that allow for a modern standard of living. That's, that's what the Global Village Construction set is. And... Uh, what else should I say about that? <laughs> well, what, what, are, what are the goals? What are the benchmarks uh, uh, towards what is the major goal and what are, what are the step uh, goals or benchmarks on right. the path towards that goal? Yeah. So we do have a 20-year plan, game plan for that. So the idea was formed in about 2000 eight or nine, the Global Village Construction Set idea came about basically from realizing that, wow, if I'm going to try to build civilization from scratch, I need power, economic power or machine power, basically to, to provide all the things that I need to survive. So machines, you know, that's technology, that's the role of technology to provide things simply. Uh, so selected basically a, the representative set from all the different sectors to make that easy. The 20 year roadmap from now on, I actually published that this year. If you go to our wiki, you can go to the roadmap, but we talk about the successive phases of that. Like right now we did a lot of the mechanical devices like tractors, brick presses, uh, many mechanical things. And then we're gonna transition more into things like power electronics for renewable energy or the actual making of parts. Cause right now we're, we're buying all the parts off shelf, but we want to transition to making our own parts, 
and then making your own materials. So the most advanced machine there is the aluminum extraction from clay, which uses clay aluminosilicate, which has got the aluminum in it, and using processes on a small scale, we're going to say, hey, we can do that. Right off any parcel of 40 acres or so, we can extract all these different resources from the rock, sunlight, plants, soil, water. So taking uh, the whole global industrial system, compressing it into the smallest package possible. That's the name of our experiment. We're trying to say, okay, here's a 40-acre facility. Can we create up to an advanced standard of living on it? That's what we're actually trying. So we're building the, te the necessary technology. And of course, it's going to get interesting once we get the social technology. Because now it's going to be time to get people getting along together with one another. So the, the machines are just the first step. They're, they're a, an enabling uh, set that's required. Before we go talking about, okay, what do we talk, how do we get societal, scientific, cultural progress? Well, we have to start somewhere. So naturally, the first step is living in our mud huts as we did initially and then transitioning to much better buildings and up down to modern life, compressing, let's say, you know, 10,000 years of history into a decade. Okay, so, so give us an idea. Give us some clue about what are those 50 sort of irreplaceable, fundamentally mm -hmm. important machines. Yeah. What you call the civilization starter kit. What does that look like? Well, if you eat, you're using a tractor and combine, whether you know it or not, to put that bread on your table. Those are two machines. You talk, then you talk about house construction, things like a brick press, sawmill, a cement mixer, things like a trencher for laying pipe, tractors, bulldozers. Then you talk about energy, things like windmills, solar concentrators, uh, engine. We actually have a modern steam engine as part of the set right now. Huh. There, and there's energy production, which I just mentioned. There's, there's fuels like we're actually doing gasifiers with charcoal. There's power electronics, so everything you need for controlling power from windmills or solar charging, induction furnace, welder, inverter. Uh, welder is a big one. Then you get into, the, there's materials, two main, main things there, which are bioplastic production, as well as aluminum extraction from clay, which is the most advanced machine, aluminum silicate, that's clay. Can, you can do that on a small scale. It's been proven, say, for lunar applications. So we're taking this large set and saying, can we do this? What's the smallest scale that an efficient system based on these tools can be created? So that's, that's our in-practice experiment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I see. One, one, one more thing to add is sure. the set is gen generative. So it's a universal constru constructor. With the fabrication capacity, we can do rough things like torching, welding, but then you get into things like precision machining, uh, basically metal rolling, induction furnace. So you can take basically anything from, if you have a country which has a scrap metal stream, you can reprocess it to make, make virgin steel, you can machine it to make precision parts, and then you have the industrial age. And you go from there, you can make other machines and other machines that make other machines so that you can recursively get to any single technology that you need. How about uh, microprocessors or computers? That's not in the 50 tools, but the tools that you can make. So for that, you would require a clean room, some vacuum pumps, some metal machines, vacuum chambers, etc. Those are things you can make with this set, though it's not explicitly one of the 50 machines. Mm -hmm. I do think you can do that. Say you have a community. Even on a small, you can, I believe you can do an experiment on the 40 acre scale with as few as a couple of dozen people that can do that, incorporating ideas like automation or the, the multi purpose micro factory kind of concept. So, basically, with the ability to get design from anywhere, you have infinite knowledge power. So, Alvin Toffler's book, The Power Shift, talks about. Military power, economic power, and knowledge power in their order of refinement and power. The most powerful form of power is knowledge. So if you have that and you have machines to use that knowledge, like 
automated CNC machines, you can produce anything. So the idea is with knowledge power, you can do anything on a much lower scale than ever before. And you might say, oh, well, what, you know, got plenty of chances to get, get society right. Well, right now, the, the nature of technology is that everything can be smaller. So instead of centralized operations, you can do things on a much smaller scale, which gets you back much more into balance with the natural life support systems. And I think that can have a unique opportunity, bring about a unique opportunity to get things right by relocalization, uh, making things take technology appropriate and balance with the natural life support systems. Do you have to sort of reinvent the wheel for each of those machines? I mean, do you start from scratch from the ground up to build whatever you need to build? Or do you uh, somehow can use some starting point or something? Mm -hmm. Are we reinventing the wheel? Yes. <laughs> Let me tell you a story. That's what I said in my TED talk. But the real truth is no. We build on industry standards. You study first what has come before you. That's called time binding and the general theory of semantics. Kozybski, that's the seminal work on time binding, the unique human ability to take knowledge from before and build upon it. So you'd be a fool to not study what people have done. And then we modify it. We make it appropriate. We make it modular lifetime design, we, we put all our values upon the starting of what, what industry has done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I can see that. My, my only concern is patent protection or mm -hmm. so on, so that someone doesn't go after you for saying you use these, these, these yeah. or, or something like that. It's, a, it's an issue that comes up all the time in, in discussions. It hasn't happened in practice yet. But the thing that's uh, good about the ecological approach is because we're doing generalized integrated e ecosystems like an integrated house or an aquaponic greenhouse or or a construction set for building any machine so we're not focusing on a single machine typically we, we talk about systems or multi-purpose machines which typically because they use old technology our strength is in integration not the fact that we're going to develop a point technology because all those point technologies let's just use what we have right now we could we could do it really well mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's let's talk a little bit about the values then, since you mentioned them already, uh, and, and I think important mm -hmm. perhaps this yeah. would be yeah. one about the name open source. You see, I recently actually yeah. interviewed Richard Stallman on my show, and he's very yeah. well known for uh, kind of even fighting against open source uh, and pushing yeah. forward the idea, which by the way predates open source by maybe 15 years of the yeah. so-called free software movement. So yeah. tell me a little bit, are you aware of the distinction between the two? And, and if you are, then why choose open source rather than free software? Yeah, that's a good question. And when I started in the initial idea of open source ecology in 2003, I was not aware of that distinction. And perhaps if I were, I might have called it free source ecology, referring to freedom. But open source was a known word. Uh, yes, the distinction is more about talking about the ethics versus the commercial aspects. And we like Richard Stallman. It's great stuff. It's the right motivations. And we just um, missed that boat. And I can't tell what would have happened if, if I knew that earlier. Now, uh, also, the other thing to, to note about open source, certainly, like, I do have a frustration with certain parts of it, like the whole maker movement thing, missing a critical aspect of the power of open source technology. To the maker movement, typically, as promulgated by O'Reilly and company, they, uh, in my opinion, are reducing the power of that concept to tinkering as hobbyists. But the power of open source is much deeper. It's about transformation of the very systems we live in. It's about reforming industry. It's about creating a new operating system for how we do business. And that is transparently, openly, letting people collaborate truly so that we blow the, out of the water any kind of conceptions of, of accelerated innovation. We are in a dead zone of innovation today. We are not open source in general. Patents certainly prevent it, prevent innovation. Um, so in my view, we are in a stone age of open, of, of open innovation, which can be unleashed with the freedom, the, the free, libre, open source 
uh, power of hardware, especially because hardware is still 80% of the economy. Now, for any skeptics who, who would dispute my claim about patents decelerating innovation, you need to study the initial history of what happened with the Watts steam engine at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And there's an excellent graph and article about this. And we, I talk about it in my talks all the time. Uh, during Watts' time, when he had the monopoly on the steam engine, there was a certain rate of innovation. When that patent expired, the innovation doubled. And that's statistically shown. And it was not, if you study that history, it was not because of some freak event. Oh, yeah, just things got better. No, it's because of that open sharing. At that time, they did not have the internet. They published, these new guys published in a journal and accelerated innovation. So if you want a, a good historical example, that's one. That's a great point. And, and actually now it's much worse, unfortunately, because at the time of James Watts, of course, the periods that he had monopoly over his patent was what, 10 or 20 years at most? Mm -hmm. Now, in some cases, it spans 50 to 70, 75 years, something crazy like that. No, does it? I thought it, the typical time was 19 years. Well, there is some confusion between, in, in my mind, probably between patenting and trademarking. But, mm -hmm. uh, for example, because uh, I recently watched a whole kind of thing about uh, Disney uh, mm -hmm. meddling uh, with the trademarking of stuff because oh, yeah. uh, originally Mickey mm -hmm. Mouse was to expire in 10, <laughs> in 15, 20 years. Then they changed the, the law to 50 years. Then, then they changed it to 75 years. And now they're working even more to change the law again. So every time when basically Mickey Mouse is about mm. to expire, this mm. there's this huge <laughs> effort for uh, Congress to change the law and to mm. extend the period of, of the trademark. And I think that yeah. goes hands in, uh, the same thing happens with patents, actually. Yeah, I think you can extend patents. Yes, I'm aware of the trademarks, but that's a different story. We have a trademark on the name Open Source Ecology, <laughs> and that's to protect the brand so no one uses it and claims that they are us or start doing proprietary stuff and claim that they're us. So that's okay. But I think the, the yeah, for me, the relevant, much more relevant thing is hardware patents, the USPTO patent office, what happens there. Yeah, it's a, it's a lost cause. I mean, the, the way it works from what I understand is simply they're overwhelmed with the way trolls work. Patent office is overwhelmed with claims. They stamp everything. And then patent trolls claim they can sue you if, they, if you infringe. But a lot of times you would win in court because most of those things are empty. It's based on prior art. But the point is that works for the trolls because nobody has time to go to time or money to go to court. Yeah. So and unfortunately, it's broken. Very long and very, very expensive. Most people actually are unable to afford to, to go through the process. Right. Right. So that's 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 another part of the where it's detrimental because it, it it's it's good enough to scare people away. But let mm -hmm. Uh, switch back here to the innovation mm -hmm. point that you made. Yeah. You see, another person I interviewed on my show is Jaron Lanier. And he had very strong criticism about open source software in general. And he's like, mm -hmm. look at the software movement, right? Mm -hmm. Where's the innovation? All the innovation, he says, according to him, has been on the front of the uh, paid software, whether it's uh, you know Microsoft, whether it's Apple. And then basically, in Jaron's view, open source software mm -hmm. is copying all the innovation that's been happening in patent software. Do you agree mm -hmm. with that view? <laughs> I don't know where that argument comes from because it's not consistent with any historical evidence, but I think it's the, the exact opposite is the truth. Apple, Facebook, Microsoft, they all made their wealth on, open, on taking open source software and closing it up. So I don't know where the other arguments come from. Tell me a little bit more about that because it sounds very surprising at first uh, glance. Right. Uh, what that means is software with Stallman used to be free. Once it became economically significant, pretty much companies started patenting it. But the stuff that came out originally was open source. And then people like Bill Gates would take it and make proprietary software on top of it. Same as with Apple. I'm sh unfortunately, 
don't have the specifics right here, but the th specifics we can point to right now about open source software, what are you talking about <laughs> with uh, proprietary being the thing? The whole backbone of the internet, the server infra infrastructure, Apache, those are all open source projects. So I don't know where that, that claim is coming from. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Speaking of, of how software migrated from its uh, original kind of open source in the 70s and early 80s to mm -hmm. there's a very famous letter written by mm -hmm. Bill Gates yeah. addressing specifically people like uh, uh, Richard Stallman mm -hmm. and why we, people should start paying for software, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. which is a, a good historical record of, of the specific transition from from. Yeah, ninety nine percent being sort of open source and one percent page to like. Yeah, uh, I I must add. So my wife Katrina Mota, she wrote her PhD thesis on open source hardware. And she studies the history of the software, so we can send a, give a link to that thesis. So you can read more about what I just said. Mm -hmm. Sure, that's fantastic. I'll put I'll put the link in the in the show notes. Uh, but so let me ask you then, what kind of operating system do you use on your machines? Well, I clearly, Dell Precision M6500, that's, I got Linux, uh, I got Ubuntu 15.10. Very so I try cool. to live that, yeah. Very cool. So, so you're trying to, to walk the talk too? Absolutely. And right now we've migrated to FreeCAD from using SketchUp. FreeCAD is an excellent project. It's growing like crazy. So we're developing a whole open source stack for the design work, which consists of Blender, FreeCAD, Sweet Home 3D. Those pretty much cover all the needs we have for design work. Mm -hmm. And they're high, highly expandable, modular, scalable systems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very, very interesting. Let me just zoom back up here for a little bit and, and just ask you, mm -hmm. is there maybe tension between open source ecology and capitalism? You have to define your terms, but no, I mean, uh, from the knee-jerk response, no, I mean, open source is about making an efficient enterprise. We talked a little bit before about some of the inefficiencies with distribution as one of the issues. Well, the whole system is quite inefficient. I think open source is where everyone's going to. I don't think people are aware of that. But if you talk about an efficient business, you have to be open source. How do you innovate without open source? I mean, just think about it. When you cannot talk open, I was just thinking about this the other day. It's like there's a company, they're innovating compressed air storage. Well, they can't talk to anybody. They, they've got secrets. Whereas we, we, we just Google on the internet, we find the subject matter experts in it, we talk to them, we talk to everybody, and we try to download that in an hour, what took them a lifetime to learn. A proprietary company cannot do that. And I don't think they're gonna survive in the face of open source. Mm -hmm. So interesting, so you, <laughs> you think the future belongs to open source, both hardware and software and so on? Mm, absolutely, that's my biased opinion. <laughs> okay, then it, it's yeah. Uh, I mean, I believe it. I mean, no. I mean, if you look at it, I mean, you do see a lot of evidence of businesses. Everyone talks about efficiency. How do you become le leaner and meaner? Well, I mean, the endpoint is is open. I think that's. I mean, I think that writing is on the wall. If you kind of look at it, it's like people are talking more about crowdsourcing, open innovation. This that's definitely a buzzword, and and I just don't think. Don't, don't see how you can compete in a world where knowledge is more important when your business model relies on not cooperating in knowledge. How are you going to do it? I mean, you can create these massive proprietary consortia. You're always going to keep paying for them, but knowledge is faster than what you can pay for it. That's my opinion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Martin, uh, so we touched a little bit on uh, Richard Stallman's idea for free software. So let me see if we can take yeah. that to your concept of true freedom mm -hmm. and perhaps mm -hmm. you can talk us, uh, uh, talk us through that. Yeah, okay, true freedom. I say that the most essential type of freedom, it's from my personal experience. I was born in Poland. There were tanks rolling down my streets when I left in 1984. Um, those the dark times, of basically behind the Iron Curtain, you have to wait in line for food. I came to America, this is great. Freedom. What is freedom? Well, there's Poland. Was it Wojciech Jaruzelski at the time? Yeah, it was. That's right. And um, so what's freedom? It's like everything in America s seemed like, wow, this is great. Everything is easy. We've got everything. I aced, was ace in school. You know, I can 
I wa walked into the, my <laughs> the grocery store. It was so colorful, whereas the shelves were empty in Poland, etc. Well, so so that kind of thinking from my background, and also my grandparents. I mean, they were in a war. My grandmother was in a concentration camp. My grandfather was in the Polish underground, derailing German supply trains. Wow. Sad times. So we come to this age. What's the difference between a time of misery and and prosperity? Well. So I, 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 my conclusion is that the most essential type of freedom begins with our individual ability to convert those abundant natural resources into to freeing ourselves from material constraints. And that's why the focus that we have is the open source hardware part. Because the more capable we are of doing that, the less susceptible are we are to others. The more autonomous we are, the more close we are to our natural supply chains that, that provide our very existence. So that's that's what shut down, like you know, software now. Software is the craze and everything. Anyway, yeah. yeah. So does that, interject? that that to accomplish uh, true freedom, as you see it, we have to be self-sufficient. Um, we have to accomplish true freedom. We have to be as close to that as as, as practical. Like for us, for me personally, I want to show the limits of what's possible with advanced, modern, appropriate open source technology. And I want to show what the limit case of that is. But in general, the, the more people participate with their own provision, I think it makes for a better society. Um, and then, of course, you have to say, well, how do we have surplus at that time? Well, that's where that concept maybe of the farmer scientist comes in. It's like, well, your evolution is mixed up with providing as well. So the farmer provides, the scientist is the intellectual guy we kind of combine both of them into a lifestyle where life is really meaningful because you're close to nature you can say or close close to the um, eco ecology of, of everything and that's the the idea behind relocalization and why people complain about the global supply chains uh, it's a question of scale the better we are at doing it on a smaller scale, I think the more sound uh, a reasonable society, more just governable society can, we can have. Yeah. That's, that, I mean, that's a big topic. I mean, no, we, we, it's like it would almost be impossible for, it's like it's such a crazy idea to say, oh, you got to be producing everything. But the, the point is, produce something. Get back in touch with some element of that very fundamental human need, which is to produce things. I think that's very deep within us. I don't think our indoctrination today removes us. It's very fundamental, like when we were hunter-gatherers, cavemen and women, we made things. And I think that that need in people is very present and it's part of a sane psychology. We need it. Mm -hmm. let, let, me, let me try to give you a response from my own personal point of view here and, and yeah. some skepticism maybe from elsewhere. But yeah. Because you said as close as practical, right? So I, yeah. I don't know how we measure that from sort of objective point of view, but I'm just, and, you, and then you added, well, produce something. So here's the thing. From my point of view, I produce podcasts, for example, right? Mm -hmm. So that's my something. I, mm -hmm. I produce podcasts. I produce a mm -hmm. blog. Uh, on a certain topic, mm -hmm. which kind of cherry it, it has been the fruits of my labor for the last six years that I've been giving away for free. Yeah. But to be honest, me and my wife, we don't see ourselves going back to the farm personally uh, and, and sort of growing our own food. And, and, and that's much easier for me, by the way, than for my wife, because I grew up in Bulgaria. So I can, I, I've done that when I was a child. She's never mm -hmm. done that in her life because she grew up in Canada and she has her own thing with her own business that she's producing now, but right. seeing ourselves going back to the land. So, and isn't there sort of a skeptic would say, isn't mm -hmm. there a benefit to specialization of labor and economies of scale and the way our global economy is structured right now to produce that surplus based on which we make progress and we kind of mm -hmm. raise our standard of living. So, we don't want to take you away from blogging to dig some potatoes, do we? <laughs> no. But what are some of the things that you can do that are very practical? And it goes back to the ecology part. Integrate. What can we integrate right now? For example, in your house, you can, say, have solar panels, water catchment, and 
or an aquaponic greenhouse where you can produce vegetables or fish without much work. Or you can have, for example, have a 3D printer where you're actually making useful things that save you a trip from the store. So there's many different levels you can get involved in it. What I'm saying is that it's, it's very nice to just see some of that happen because I think psychologically it gives people a certain type of empowerment that you don't see without doing that. I think it's really empowering. So once again, striving for a more integrated, balanced life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and to be honest, that's a very, very good and important point, and which is, by the way, why about uh, two months ago, both me and my wife, uh, well, actually, now it's almost three months ago, both me and my wife went vegan, uh, simply because, uh, you know, people in the developing world are developing Mm -hmm. taste for meat, but unfortunately, if they were to have the same levels of meat consumption that we have in America, for example, we need like four or five planets for the current population, let alone for Mm -hmm. 90 people or so. Yeah. And that's just, you know, one of other reasons such as, you know, uh, suffering animals, ethics, and even Mm -hmm. our own health, which all those reasons put together basically pushed us into uh, Mm -hmm. experimenting or actually by by this point, I'm not sure if experimenting is the right word because we're Mm -hmm. committed. So it's been three months that we became vegan. And that's only one of those choices that you said that we can, that have a sort of a whole ecology kind of an impact of other things, Mm -hmm. right? (laughs) Yeah. That's a very important thing because all of our choices are are ethical choices at the end of the day and can make a difference. Right. For which reason, a lot of people are starting to eat insects too. That's a big movement that's, that's started. Right. I'm not, I'm not that strong. <laughs> I, I prefer to, to stick my beans and legumes and, and lentils and, and pasta and, and things like that. And lots of bananas. Yeah. I'll just have some fish from my aquaponic greenhouse. Sure, that's not a bad idea too. Uh, uh, generally, in Canada, I think the largest part for example, of, of salmon that you can buy in, in the store has been farmed salmon. And mm-hmm. one fish, uh, one farmed salmon kills anywhere from six to eight, and in some cases maybe up, uh, supposedly up to 10 wild salmon. Uh, mm-hmm. So that's one reason I, I didn't want to support that industry anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, uh, let's move on to your kind of upcoming uh crowdsource uh, fundraising campaign uh, yeah. on the, uh, t- together with the Open House uh, Institute. Can you please tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, so we're starting an initiative, so source ecology with Open Building Institute to make affordable housing widely, widely accessible. It's a new, new initiative. We're kicking that off on June 14 with a Kickstarter and a press release a two-year effort to end up with a, a house that actually meets living building challenge certification, which is the most advanced green building certification out, of, out there in the world. So it's an ambitious plan of integrating, basically putting together all the technology that we have to make a real viable product that everybody wants, a house. Uh, we're also including an open source materials production facility, so we can spread lumber, concrete, polycarbonate glazing that's 3D printed, open source paints, and bioinsulation. You say concrete, whoa, hey, well, we have limestone under our, our surface of the soil or the quarry, and you can make lime concrete using biomass to fuel it. So the fir- world's first regenerative concrete production. Yes, so we're pushing the limits on a lot of fronts. Open designs, a lot that you can contribute to of designs, Design guides, software, including FreeCAD, Sweet Home, and Blender. We have all the models in a, in a CAD, but you can download it. You can design your own houses, and we're also um, tri- starting a training program so that you c- not everybody wants to build, right? So like you mentioned, you, you don't want to build your house. You want to do your, your podcast. You can hire us for a small fee above the cost of materials. We're developing a model where we train people so that they can go to other locations. That's kind of the nutshell of the whole program. Okay, so mm-hmm. tell us a little bit more about sort of the specifics of those houses. I mean, how li- because yeah. people would people who want to live in them want to know as mm-hmm. much as possible. So, yes, tell us a little bit about the size and the cost, for example. Right. So, using the system, we can build a small starter home that's expandable with super ecological features 
for under $25,000. That's 700 square feet expandable. Now, what comes in it? So that's like, okay, that's, that's pretty good. But what comes in it? Well, first of all, it's got 3,000 watts of solar power. This is on the, you'll see it on the Kickstarter, 3, 000, fully off grid. It traps its own water and filters it for potable. It's got a biogas plant. So you're actually cooking on your own gas from your toilet, which is a separating toilet, separates urine and, and solids. We've got thermoelectric generator off the biomass pellet stove, which serves as a hot water heater, both for household and the hydronic heating system. It's got some natural building materials like the compressed earth block brick floor and some walls. Uh, so pretty much highly, I mean, highly off grid on the energy front, water, sanitation, um, using local biomass for the fuel. We're actually designing it so that the landscaping around it provides the biofuel crop. So there's, there's landscape, landscaping that can provide both food and a fuel crop. And on top of this model, we have the, green, the greenhouse, the aquaponic greenhouse, which combines the fish and vegetables in, an, in a closed loop system. So, so you can pretty much have all the fish and vegetables that's sufficient for a family. So that's the design, and, and after that, evolving that to the next iteration, so, it's, so it meets the living building challenge specification. Tell and, me a little bit mm -hmm. about the aquaponics, because that's interesting. You mentioned yeah. twice. what kind of fish and what kind of vegetables are we talking about? And what yeah. Kind of specs on that? Yeah, I can send you some excellent pictures on that. We have tilapia, which is a tropical fish. In water, we've got in-ground ponds that have 3,000 gallons total. But the productivity of that, once it's up fu fully running, right now we've got a bunch of younger fish. We just did the first build in November last year. We had about 35 people come to that, and we built that structure fully in five days. But fish, vegetables, just anything that grows. So like we had a lot of bok choy and lettuce already. You can plant all your crops like tomatoes and anything else. But essentially, using the vertical space, we're using vertical towers, which have the fish water dripping through that, and that's what the plants eat, and therefore you're able to use the full vertical horizontal space. Mm -hmm. Right now, we're actually using it as a nursery for a large plant out of hazelnuts. So the other area we're getting into is hazelnut and chestnut breeding as a, as a food and fuel crop. Um, so we're using we, we're using the greenhouse right now for that, but that's been actually very interesting response. I mean, everyone loves this aquaponic greenhouse. People uh, are attracted to growing their own food in, in the kind of quantities that aquaponics can provide, which is it's a, it's a very efficient system. It uses like ninety percent less water than standard agriculture. It's uh, it's been a great experience so far. I mean, we got flooded with the vegetables, the lettuce, and bok choy that we were growing. Mm -hmm. we, had, we were given away to the animals and stuff like that. And and what about the the sort of the first prototype models? Where are you guys building them, and and what's the kind of uh, mm -hmm. costs or, or targets that you're aiming to achieve with your right? Company? Right. So costs and where we build. So we we do food everything. So for example, the the buildings we live in are made of the bricks and the building materials that we do. So we built the first greenhouse at our place to test it. We're actively testing it and evolving it. And uh, the first- We're talking about the houses that you're going to be building on Kickstarter. Those will be housing for the students. As I mentioned, we're starting an immersion training program. So that's actually gonna be housing for the students in our program. We're going to take several builds. We're looking at about four builds that we're going to take to other locations. So anywhere in the United States. Now we're so going to get four houses. When you say four builds, you mean four houses? Four houses of seven hundred square foot each, mm -hmm. at a cost, a total cost, about twenty five thousand in materials, and our each. business model, yes, each. Yeah. And the model is we're going to charge a fee to pull this entire event off, including a swarm build with about 30 to 100 people. So what we do is we organize a workshop, an immersion training workshop where you get to build the whole house from A to Z. And we charge for that. We charge the client a fee for building that house. The owner ends up with a house at about $10,000 over the bill of materials cost. So say about 35,000. 35, okay. Yep. And, and what's the time frame on, on a build like that per house? Per house, 
is right now it's infinite preparation. Like right now to, for example, to do the next build in November, we're going to spend the full time developing that. Once we have it all developed, I went through the numbers. It's going to be about 11 days from securing a client to walking through the, basically the permissions, permits, zoning, to organizing the build, organizing the workshop. On our side, the, the organizational overhead is about 11 days of work, which of which five days are the actual build on site. So our goal is to develop a model where for every single house that we build out there, it takes us 11 day, days of full-time organizational overhead. From order to delivery. Yep. And that's essentially what we're going to be charging that money for. Uh, a service such that you don't have to worry about it. You contact The process will look something like you contact us, you're interested. We start with a site assessment, client assessment. We need to find land with the client. Then we to, need to organize the build event. And, and the thing that we have, we have innovated, this is actually quite interesting. Using these modular build techniques, what we do is have a large team working in parallel, building modules on the ground, a large number of them, which are then assembled quickly into place. So using this technique, we've been able to get the build time down to five days for a complete house from the foundation. Wow. So that's, that's pretty impressive. That's pretty impressive. So right now you're kind of setting up the process for that? Or standard, we're setting up, standardizing the process kind of? We're standardizing the process such that we can train the students. So this, we're starting the immersion program next June. We're going to have probably two-person pilot program. We're actually going to spend six months with you and we're going to teach you everything that we know. Because right now we can do it but nobody else can. So we really need to get this training program. That's been the biggest block. I mean, we are, in, as you see, I mean, that package inclu includes so many different things that nobody can do it. We need to train people and scale that. So basically, you're going to build the first few ones uh, mm -hmm. on your own farm sort of uh, land? First two on our farm, then we're going to take it out on the road and then build the next Living Building Challenge compliant one at our, at our place and then see where we go from there. That's a two-year program, essentially, from launch, product launch on June 14. And one of the selling points, it seems to me, to those uh, uh, structures is that they can be, let's say, in the middle of nowhere, uh, Wisconsin or Montana. <laughs> or something. That's, that's exactly self-sustainable. That's exactly right. It's, it is autonomous housing. Even in the first implementation, we're actually off-grid on a sewer, the energy, the water, it's it's essentially an autonomous house. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. And uh, I mean, the, the thing, I mean, I, I do want to just emphasize that, I mean, the amount of knowledge, the knowledge power, as we mentioned, military economic knowledge power, we're tapping a whole array of subject matter experts on all the details of this build from the zoning to, to the regenerative housing, eco materials, re renewable energy, we're able to tap these people and we're putting all of these on our board of advisor. We're trying to get about a hundred people on that board of our advisors to pull in all that intense knowledge that's required to do that. There's a lot of, lot of technique that goes into there. And I think the unique point of the open source route is that we can do that. People are willing to, to give up their time and contribute to that and advise us because they, they see the greater vision behind that in order to achieve that super low cost. I mean, we're probably, and, and uh, this is speculation, but I suspect we're going to be talking about like a half a million dollar house that we can pull off for about $35,000. So that's wow. kind of the, the goal. Wow. Okay. I hope so. I hope so. Uh, now, what's the sort of biggest misconception about open source ecology in general and the open mm. house initiative in particular that oh yeah people would be kind of coming up with this preconceived mm. conception that you want to clarify once and for all yeah number one misconception is that we have it all like we said in my ted talk i said we've developed we, we've conceptualized this 50 item set of tools since then basically everyone thinks it's already done it's not done we've got a few machines like the brick press the house the power cube, the saw pulverizer, I mean, there's the 3D, 3D printer. Those are full products that you can download pretty much. And recommend that you build them, but there's 45 other machines. We, we haven't 
done. We've prototyped about 20 altogether, 20 other different machines. And part of the, the thing is that we're seeing how they fit as a system. And if we see that, okay, now we need to make things work better. Like for example, the tractor, it's, it's highly modular thing. It's got its own engine unit, wheel units, frame units, implements. Uh, they have to work together. And once we develop the new thing, like for example, uh, I don't know, the, our new engine or the, the modern steam engine or something else or the gasifier, well, we're going to have to make sure that it fits with the whole product ecology. So there's always about uh, the idea of integrating, modifying it so that you can uh, work, the whole system works together. So that point is important for those people who come as developers because developers will typically come in and say, okay, do it this way. And, and I say, hmm, well, what about this, that, and the other features that make this a complete set according to our OSC specifications of modularity, lifetime design, local materials, et cetera, uh, open source design, et cetera. So the biggest misconception on the development front is that we're just making individual things. We are not. They all fit as a system. And as far as just the overall package, people think we've done this already and we haven't. And maybe it's the way I talk. I, I talk about the future. Like I said, we're going to have this amazing house. It's not there yet. That's why we're doing the Kickstarter. So <laughs> there you go. Okay. All right. Very interesting. And how can people help you? Other than uh, right. Right now, the immediately is, of course, the Kickstarter. But as far as the design process, that's a, that's a whole paradigm. The open source development platform, we are looking for people to, to contribute to that. Right now, you can download some of our designs, and for every single product, we have development spreadsheets that go through all the single steps of a development process. You got to start with that, with a requirements, concept, design, build, data collection. There's a, about a hundred steps there. People can actually get involved in doing that. Just working, like for example, studying of industry standards. If we want to build this backhoe, well, or this car open source car. Well, what are the best, best practices out there? There's a lot of different things that people can get involved in, but, but it requires uh, some study of the system. That's the challenge because it's an integrated system. It's a little difficult, but the way we're addressing that is right now we're producing like with the house housing and the tractor, we're, we're creating reports. You can literally download the individual library parts, which already have been engineered. And right now, this is what we're launching June 14. You can download that and build a complete house. You don't have to worry about the engineering. We've already done it in the modules. We've done a lot of design work already. So we really invite people to start downloading our stuff, playing, making design, and submitting it back to us. Where can Help us build this 700 square foot house. We don't have a final design. So that's going to be at openbuildinginstitute.org. That's which is going to be released. I know as far as the tractor, there's a page on the wiki called uh, OSC part library, and you can actually download the, the engine unit, the frame units, the wheel units, some implements. You can literally design a complete tractor using that. The, our next step is we don't have a design guide. We do have some documents, but we really need to make a nice, beautiful design guide so that we can teach people, okay, here's the, all the considerations you need to do to design a tractor. For every single machine that we do, every project, we want to do a design guide so you really empower people to take that into their own hands. And if anybody wants to do that, like on the tractor construction set, engineers, mechanical engineers, help us write the design guide. Then we can get everybody designing. Mm -hmm. And because my show is called really Singularity One on One, mm -hmm. so I want to ask you, uh, What's your take on artificial intelligence and the technological singularity in general? And how does open ecology or the open mm -hmm. house initiative fit or does it within sort of that bigger realm? Clearly. Just the other day I said, from mud hut to singularity in one day. <laughs> Once we have the entire set of machines, we can literally create an entire civilization using the parallel building models, which we've developed now for, for up to 50 people. We want to do the same for a thousand people. Let's get a thousand people. We got 40 acres. We got these facilities. Everyone go to work in parallel. Let's do it. Uh, as far as the, the singularity, um, I think that that the time, I mean, the singularity kind of the way I interpret it is that the technology base gets so advanced that it becomes very, very easy to, to execute on creating real reality from ideas. 
just amazingly so. And that addresses also the question we asked you, like you're a blogger, how are you gonna do other stuff? Well, because it's gonna be so easy. We are making the tools available. Um, our goal is to, to provide public access to all kinds of technological power. The singularity uh, relates to that. I think kind of like the, the arguments there are a little bit um, overblown towards like, oh, what if this you know, supercomputer is gonna take over the world? Well, it's always the good old fight of good versus evil. I mean, we, we have to participate in our reality. So uh, the singularity that supercomputer does not take over human life. I mean, that's why I talk about an integrated existence. Computers can be a, an integrated part of it. So if we design an ecology where computers and advanced intelligence, that's great in general. And specifically, I think people focus on that a lot as the, the computer, the supercomputer is going to take over our life. It's, it's much more complicated than that. I, I mean, from my perspective, if I try to keep a balanced perspective about natural resources and the whole complexity of making a physical reality happen, I think that computers can be a great boon, like automation and intelligence that helps you really. If we can figure out a way to do that in an integrated way, in a holistic way, uh, I don't think we have much to worry about, uh, but it does take wisdom. We can't, we gotta use technology wisely. The more powerful the technology, the more wisely we have to wield it. And uh, so we have to be careful. And that's why I, I su suggest that people d don't specialize too much. Like don't make your entire life about the singularity or about one thing. Diversify, be an integrated human, have a, a deep connection to the natural life support systems. And then we can all design a, a system that works for everybody. And, and artificial intelligence can certainly help. But if we abuse it, and some people will, I mean, then that could be scary and things like that. Yeah, but by the way, don't specialize. That kind of reminded me very much to what Robert Heinlein once said, right. is for insects. Right, exactly. <laughs> like that quote. Mm -hmm. Well, Martin, unfortunately, our interview is coming to an end. So the last question that I always ask of my interviews is this. What's the most important thing? What's the sort of parting message that you want to send us with? I think the most important message is that we have immense power of creation to create our reality exactly the way we want it. I think technology can help us with that, but more than that, I think it's reaching back inside to get in touch with self-determination what's really meaningful for us and how technology plays part in it. But the, the biggest point is that we have the, we are the masters of our destiny. And I think people need to recognize that so that we don't give away our power to outside institutions that we are just much more in control of our lives. It's, it's really up to us as far as making history. And in your view, the, the path towards that goal would be going through the open, hor uh, open source uh, house initiative and to eventually to open source ecology in general. Yeah, I think the path we have to open up to simply open collaboration, just unleashing innovation. I think that's only possible through open source. I think that anybody who's, who says that they're trying to change the world but have a proprietary effort, to me, that's kind of a contradiction of terms because there's always be, gonna be concentrating effects from that proprietary nature. So we wanna distribute. We have the concept which we didn't get to of distributive enterprise. It's a whole other topic. We can send a link to that. But openness has to be a part of that equation. The ability to collaborate truly, to solve problems faster than they're created. Yeah, as I mentioned before, knowledge is one of those things that doesn't suffer from scarcity, but actually grows when shared. Indeed. And that knowledge can be transferred into a physical reality. Very cool. Well, I yeah. wish I wish you with good luck open with source that. hardware. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. I wish you good luck with that transfer of knowledge 
into physical reality. Uh, and uh, I want to thank you very much for being with us today, Martin. Thank you so much. I was glad to be here and look forward to seeing this online. If you guys enjoy this show, you can help me make it better in a couple of ways. You can go and write a review on iTunes, or you can simply make a donation. Thank <laughs> you.